Well there, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am Mario Rostovsky, and today we have a very special edition of Mario Sistry Talks. Uh, we are joined today with a very special lady who I am privileged enough to call a member of my church, whom I affectionately call Baba Olga. Now, she's not my grandmother directly, but uh, she is a grandmother of sorts to the Massing community here. She's had quite an experience and quite a life story that uh, she was very um, willing and uh, very um, capable of sharing with us today. So um, we're going to ask some questions here for her, kind of talk to her about her life, her experiences, and uh, um, I'll kind of let it uh, go from there. So, Bob Olga, thank you so much for, again, taking some time to uh, speak with us here today. So I just wanted to really get to know a little bit more about your experiences and uh, your uh, you know, life story. Exactly, exactly. So let's just kind of start with, uh, with the basics. Um, when were you born and uh, where were you born? Okay, uh, I was born in uh, village Oromnik in Macedonia. Mm -hmm. It was 1941, June the 1st. Now, what might people know that village as today? Is there like a different name for it? Oh, well, it was changed by the Greek government uh, and it's called uh, Karias. Yeah. My goodness. So cause I want to make sure people understand it from, from both sides there. But uh, so you're born in 1941. Okay. What can you tell us just uh, from that time period about your parents and kind of their lives? I mean, how did they make a living back then? Well, my parents was uh, just like all the villagers. It was in a village. Uh, my mother was uh, uh, three years old when her father passed away. Oh my goodness. And uh, her brother was only seven. So they were both very young you know, and they're orphans, yeah. So the life was very hard. If one goes, then there was too much, you know, too much uh, tension, too much work for the other one, mm -hmm. unless if they get remarried or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyways, my mother grew up to be like 16, 17, and she fell in love. There was a one family, very, uh, very big family. There was like four brothers and cousins they're all together living all together but they had like three four houses okay. right in the middle of the village so there was a big house where uh, it was built right in front in in front of the water well we had a water well there mm -hmm. Chem chesma we called it chesma mm -hmm. yeah and everybody was coming there to get their water for their homes you know for everything that mm -hmm. they needed yeah and uh, uh, right in front of that, there was a, a gumno. Mm -hmm. Gumno means, uh, you know, wherever they worked on the wheat, after they picked the wheat, then mm -hmm. they had to go with the horses, you know, going around and around and get the wheat mm -hmm. out of all the rest of it. And, mm -hmm. you know. So it was in a perfect area and right by the street also, coming all the way from another villages and going up to other villages like in Germant, which mm -hmm. was a big village. Okay. okay. And then there was a little, oh, I would call it creek or little, uh, uh, it wasn't a wide or wasn't, but there was water, fresh water running. And uh, this is where they did, the women, they did their washing of the clothes all. They would take it, mm -hmm. take the big pots and uh, turn the fire underneath and cook, you know, uh, kind of uh, warm up or boil the water. And then they would wash their clothes in, you know, like the old fashioned way. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, then they had plenty of water and they would come back, especially in the wintertime. It was very hard because it was cold. Everything would be freezing and their bodies, you know, I mean, they were very, very bad, you know, very old fashioned. Yeah. So anyways, uh, um, my father was uh, working. He was a little bit more educated than uh, the rest of the villagers because his, his father was, uh, you know, wealthy uh from probably his parents and whatever but they had more money than anybody else and uh, they had two sons my father and his uh, brother and two sisters and uh well uh, the one brother he passed away at age of 18 19. he got tb and he passed away so then my mother was uh, uh very much in love with my father they were young both of them and uh, then my father got a job in Lerin. He was working in this uh, bank, but it was like uh, a bank that they were giving uh, 
like the seeds and all that for the villagers, you know, whatever they needed, agricultural or whatever you call it, you know, bank. It wasn't like a bank, bank with the money that, you know, to be exchanged, but exchange with, you know, they're giving them whatever they needed for the parents. Okay. So anyways, he wasn't, a, he was not farmer. So my mother had all the responsibility because she had to do all the work in the village, everything, yeah. you know, and, uh, well, they lived very well, but uh, my mother was afraid of her father-in-law. He was very, you know, very kind of mean and all that. But anyways, I'm not going to go through all that. Yeah. And uh, well, then everything was okay. Then uh, my mother had, uh, the first one was a daughter, little girl. Well, she died from uh, Kashlitsa, whipping cough. Yeah, whipping cough. Then the second time she had twins. My sister, Lena, which is still alive in Canada, and the other one died also. So then my father wanted a son, like, you know, all the Macedonians. I don't know what's, the, you know, they all want a man in the house. You have to take over the, yeah. And uh, uh, there was, uh, she got twins again, boy and a girl, which everybody was so happy about it. But then the boy got sick. And they took him to lead into a doctor. We didn't have no doctors in the villages. So they took the boy over there. And on their way back, the boy dies on the way back. And the girl was already dead back home when they got home. So they both died at the same time. So my mother was very devastating because, you know, four kids, you know, and there's uh, only yeah. two alive. Anyways, uh, that was it. And then uh, well, we grew or whatever, you know just like all the little kids play in the mud, you know, just like kids in the, in the village, yeah. But then we had a big house, you know, it was right in the middle of the, uh, everybody was kind of jealous of my parents, but you know, it was like, you know, two, three generations working, whatever they had through, you know, through three generations, they amount to something. And then my grandparents died, and that was my mother and my father. My father, again, he never came to work in a, you know, uh, in the fields, like everybody, all the men. So my mother was responsible for everything. But people were kind of jealous and uh, whatever, you know, because uh, he sent his first son to learn something, you know, uh, to become somebody important, but he never was willing to do it. So he died from TB. So there was only my father and the two sisters. The two sisters, one married for somebody from Yugoslavia back then. And... Uh, the other one was still single. And all of this happened in, uh, I, you know, I was only seven, six, seven. So my memory, you know, was not that great, you know, to save what I was seeing, but it's like picture coming in front of my eyes, you know, and just go back and just disappears. Anyway, and then uh, school, uh, about school, I don't even remember going to school because, uh, but they say that, you know, I get the, what people were talking, you know, the older people, and I remember more of that than, you know, re uh, seeing it myself and remembering. Anyways, uh, we didn't learn nothing because I was seven and the, the war started. Well, first, uh, there was after World War II, they, of course, during that time with uh, the English, with the Germans, with uh, uh, who else, the Italians, there was like two different kind of parties there. And uh, there was a German, uh, Germans were uh, fighting with uh, whoever, the Germans, with the uh, English. And uh, one of the airplanes, you know, just caught a fire and, you know, well, so they saw that, the villagers saw that. Yeah, and uh, they went and they found the dead body from the airplane. So they brought the body, it was Englishmen, and uh, they buried it at our church. So then... For doing that, you know, the government, the, you know, the English government, they came and remodeled the church and all that and put a big plaque, you know, for just thank you, you know. Anyways, that was it. And then uh, started, this was during the World War II. There, there was bombs falling in our village. Things got, you know, and uh, we were, we were um, digging Harakomi. We called it Harakomi, you know, next to our house and we were hiding all over there for the bombs where we could see the bombs coming everybody just jumped in those uh what would they call trenches. It? trenches yes trenches yeah and uh well that was getting worse and worse and then once the bombs start coming and there's one house down the other house finally there was a 
time that uh, uh, there was a couple, three different organizations coming up, you know, there was like, I don't even remember how they say them in Greek. Or oh, in the meantime, also the language and all that in 1935, I think, with the, uh, uh, what's his name, the Metaxa, they just decided to wipe out the Macedonian language. So all these old people, they were not able to learn Greek at their age. It was very hard for them. And they were having spies, you know, going underneath the, uh, underneath the windows to listen if they were talking Macedonians, you know. So, and they would be punished for that. No, was your, um, did your family speak Macedonian in home? Well, we all spoke Macedonia then. And then they changed the language, you know. And uh, uh, so the young ones, then they opened the schools again, but the schools were in Greek you know, in Greek. So I never made it for school because I was too young and then seven. And then uh, this started like, you know, this war. I mean, I don't know who was bombing who now. Mm -hmm. We heard the bombs coming, you know, and then there was another uh, airplanes dropping some uh, some papers, you know, the and then uh, and then they were dropping some from Undra, they called it. Mm -hmm. Undra, like, I don't know what country it was, sending us some food like, the, oh. you know, yeah, you know, I was so young that I didn't even, we didn't even pay attention to what was going on. But finally, these other parties now, they started forming. And uh, the partisans, you know, the ones that like a communist party, whatever you call it, the people were up to their nose with all this going on. So they start forming, I call it like communist parties. Yeah. And the other ones were the fascistic, you know, fascistic. And then... All of a sudden, you know, they said they decided whoever, I think it's somewhere in the history, how they decided for our kids, for the, all the kids to take the kids and ship all the kids out of the country because it was too dangerous to, yeah. you know, when they started. And, uh, and uh, well, there were uh, about, starting from two, uh, two years old up to 14, yeah. the kids. And then over 14, if there were 15, then they would uh, they would uh, take them to the army, the black communists. So then they, they were fighting the two parties, the communists and the socialists, whatever. So okay, they you know they gather all the kids, you know all their ages, and then they had like for every fifteen to twenty kids, they had one younger a girl, younger girl, up to 50, 60. And sometimes they had older women to take care of the kids. So we didn't have no mother, father, nothing. Just uh, we called her mother, you know. So we gather in the village. It was like getting dark. People came from other villages to our village. They got there, all of them. And then we started our, I call it, voyage to the unknown, you know, yeah. because we didn't know where they were going. They told our parents, we'll bring the kids back in about a couple of weeks. So, oh, they prepare some food for us, you know, in a torby, in our little bags. Yeah. They prepare some food and uh, we didn't have, I don't remember having extra clothes, you know, in there because they told them they're coming back. Nobody was prepared for this. So we start on foot. Our village was right on the border of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, not our village, but the next village. So we had the border there, and we start walking at night, and kind of got start getting dark. And so the part, so the the other side, you know, was partisans. The other was fascisti, they call it. And uh, we start walking, walking. Of course, the one woman was responsible for so many kids, and she had to make sure that everybody was there. So we walked all the way to Yugoslavia, which the first village was Dupeni. And uh, just happened that I had an aunt, my father's sister was living there. And uh, uh, well, they heard about it too, Yugoslavia. They knew that there, there's some kids coming from, from Greece, from Macedonia. So we went to sit down and eat. My, you know, I, I, my aunt says, okay, let's sit down and eat. Well, I reached, I said, well, my mother gave us some food. You know, my sister was only four, holding on to her hands and not to lose her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we sat down, there was nothing left in our bags because the partisans were helping us, you know, crossing the border. Yeah. So they ate all our foods and they were hungry. They were just as hungry as we were. So I said, well, we don't have nothing. So, well, of course, she took care of us all that. They fed us all that. And then the next day, uh, we had to walk to another village, the closest one. So we kept on going from one village to the other. And I, I've got it written somewhere 
uh, what villages we went through until we got at the end, we went through other ones that were, anyways, it's, it's like in the memory sometimes, you know, uh, I don't even want to know about it. I want to forget it. But then all the time, I'm sorry that I did not, you know. Yeah, well, you were young. Yeah, very young. And uh, then when we got to Skopje, then they put us on trains now, trains with so many wagons. You know. mm -hmm. So then we started our village again, I mean, our voyage again. So we got to Romania now. Romania, we stayed there for 10 months in Romania, our group, because we're divided, like in groups, groups. But uh, what they were doing, like where we hear the older people, older kids, they said that uh, they would take like, let's say 10 wagons to go to this country, the next 10 to go to that country. So they just spread us all over Europe, uh, the communist countries. It was, okay, the first one was like I said, Romania, the, uh, it was so bad there. They didn't have enough food for us. We were just really hungry and sick and all that. We had all kinds of uh, diseases. It was terrible. Anyways, from there, then uh, they took us, they could not, you know, they, I guess they had asked for help, the Red Cross or something. They shipped that put us back on the trains and like I said, every when the trains took over, the, they will take so many wagons to take them to Czechoslovakia, then to Hungary, then to Romania, mm -hmm. and then finally our last uh, our group was the last one, and we ended up in Poland. Now in Poland, uh, with the situation there, was it mostly Macedonians that were with you, or was yeah, there other people? As well with you? I don't know why, but there was, we had some Greek little kids too, but I don't know what were they, you know, we never knew. We were just like, you know, there were big stuff, but not that many, mostly was Macedonians. Now, did you at that time, did you speak any Greek yourself to be able to communicate? Greek, no, but we learned it, you know. It. They put us one Greek, one Macedonian, one Greek, one Macedonian, so that was helpful, okay. you know, for you, we separated. But when we got to Poland, the first thing they did, they had to, Clean us. I mean, cleansing. Uh, first step was cleansing thing. You know, they cut all our hair. They uh, well, I don't want to stretch it, but you know, we had all kind of uh, uh, chicken pox, uh, uh, all kinds of diseases. So they had to go through all the cleansing process. You know, and uh, then finally, after we spent those, I don't know how many days or the, you know quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And then they finally, you know, they gave us some clothes and upstairs we were in Londex Druid. The first village that we were, the first town actually on Polish side was Londex Druid. Now those houses were more like, uh, uh, you know, for the rich people or whatever, for vacation and all that, but they had no place where to put us because they were fresh from 1945. So we stayed there a year or more than a year, whatever, until they found places for us. Yeah. So it was very nice in Poland. They just, I mean, took over all, you know, us and they just dressed us up and uh, they started school after that, a school in Polish. Yeah, in Polish language. Yeah, okay. Polish language. And we, we never had it so good, you know. We didn't know what to do for the beds. Oh, by the way, we never had beds in Macedonia. We slept on, uh, what do they call those? Uh, the, uh, no. not, uh, rags, whatever, like the Japanese people sleep okay. on. Yeah, okay. yeah, something like that. You know, everybody Around slept on the floor. Yeah. So my grandfather had a bed. He was the only one in the village that he had bed. Which my mother, my mother had a nightmare about that. Okay, so after that, you know, I don't know how long we spent in London. Drew, and for the kids, some of the kids were sick. Had a, like a, one of my cousins had a TB. They took all those kids and put them in the hospitals. Like all the buildings, like hospitals. So we had all that for the sick kids. I mean, they, I mean, they took care of us really good in Poland. Yeah. Now, were there um, while you're in Poland, was there any effort made by like international organizations, like Red Cross, to reunite with your family? Yeah. That was I don't know what year they started because uh, my. Uh, uh, Spiro, my husband, mm -hmm. he was, he ended up in uh, Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia, yeah, and then his uh, sisters end up in Poland, and then one sister was left behind because she was uh, in the army, sort of, you know, mm -hmm. and she stayed, she got, you know, uh, she was one in uh, Seloto, one, and they were scattered all over. The mother was uh, by herself, I think, the mother, his father was in America, so, yeah. 
So finally, through the Red Cross, this is what we heard, the Red Cross is going to take a you know, part because the, all these countries ask for help. It was Stalin, during the Stalin's time. But this is what I could hear and what I could remember. Stalin was the one that gave order that every country, communist country, has to take so many kids, you know, yeah, yeah to help the, the Poland. So that was how we were separated by trains and all that. And then after so many years, everybody started through the Red Cross again, finding out where the sisters, where the brothers, you know. And uh, that was it, you know. Finally, it took a few years until you found your rest of your, your siblings, your parents, and all that. Of course. But through all that time, you know, I didn't even know my mother. Where was she? We didn't even know. We were in uh, dorms, the bigger kids. We were separated in Poland by age group, not by family group, mm. you know, not by, you know, a relation. And, uh, uh, well, my sister, I never seen my sister for the rest of I don't know how many years because she was with the little kids mm -hmm. through the school and I was with the older kids. So they were, this is the way we were separated. All right, well, so one thing I did want to ask you now, obviously, uh, you had your experiences in Poland. How on earth did you manage to get to America? What was that experience oh, well, I got to tell you a little bit back what happened. Please, okay. please. When my mother was, you know, they came and they... Uh, forced her to go to the army, mm -hmm. to the com Communist Party, mm -hmm. you know, there, because they uh, formed two, three, I don't know how many, uh, Epon, Elas, you know, all this stuff. I don't have an idea what. But anyways, they took some to the, like, a Greek side, and some of them to the Macedonians. And the Macedonians were probably up to here, so they had to do something. So they formed this uh, Communist Party, whatever, and they were taking everybody, uh, you know, probably after 15, 16, because up to 15, they took uh, with us, with the little kids. So uh, above that, they were taking them into the army. Like, in a matter of fact, uh, Spiro's sister, she was like 16 or so, and she had to join the army, and she was fighting too. So, well, my mother was, you know, they took the kids. My mother was all by herself at home, but everybody thought that my father was, uh, you know, oh, very rich and all that. Everybody was jealous of him and all that. They kept and said, we're going to destroy him. We're going to, they, of course, they did. They ended up getting divorced. He was in the village. He never came with us, you know, Poland and all that, because he was on the other side of the villages where the war was not as bad as the, our villages. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and uh, uh, what happened then is, uh, well, she, well, she was by herself, but everybody was afraid that she might be, because they knew my father was on the other side, you know, the fascistic. And she was going to give him a sirma that they call them in Greek, you know, all kind uh, of, you know, what was going on over here, you know. And uh, they came to the house. They just, uh, I mean, they took everything, walls and everything down to find somewhere where she hides all this, where she gives information to her husband. Over there. Mm -hmm. Anyways, and then uh, they said to her with a gun in her forehead, says, well, you're going to join our army, the communist army. Mm -hmm. And she says, no, blah, 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 you know, I've got two kids, you know, that I can't, you know, uh, I don't know where my kids are, and, uh, you know, I'm a woman. Well, nothing helped. I said, either you go or you're dead right here, you know, with a gun in her forehead. Well, she said, she said to, to herself, if I don't go, they're going to kill me. If I go, maybe I'll find my kids someday, somewhere. God knows where they took them. And uh, she decided I might as well go with this army. Maybe I'll be lucky enough to be still alive and find my kids. So that's what she did. She went to a partizanka, they called her. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I know. They gave her a hard time there because they thought she was giving all the information to the other side because my father was on the other side. I mean, not that he wanted to be, but you know, they forced you to go. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, all that created like, you know, uh, the, then, uh, well, the war started between the parties, like, you know, they were fighting in Vichos, the Gramos, all those big, uh, uh, the mountains there, the known mountains. And, uh, well, she was lucky enough that uh, at the beginning they put her, like, to cook for the soldiers. And then after that, uh, they saw how strong she was. They put her to take, the, like, what did they have? Some kind of equipment that they had to take it, uh, you know, in front. Then they, she did all that. But she said, well, the bombs were, I know, they, they, they were fighting so bad, the things got so bad, people were falling down dead, left and right, left mm -hmm. and right. She says, I'll never make it out of here. But anyways, she made it. Well, whoever was still alive, 
now they lost the war, the Kabinis lost the mm -hmm. war, and they were going to go through Yugoslavia, where we crossed, you know, to another country, we crossed through Yugoslavia, and they thought they're going to follow the kids, you know, after so many months. But Tito at that time closed the gates. Mm -hmm. Nobody could go to Yugoslavia anymore. Mm -hmm. I guess he's got not people that he took. So then they didn't know if they go back, they're going to get slaughtered by the other side. Mm -hmm. So finally, they decided to go, all the soldiers, they decided to go through Albania, go to Albania and just get out from Greece. That's all, because there was going on, the war was going on between the parties. Yeah. Anyways, they went to Albania, and I don't know how long they stayed there. That I forgot what she told me. But anyways, from there, they, they put them on a, a big ship, and they sent them all around to Poland, around and uh, through Baltic and all that. And some of them ended up in Russia, mm -hmm. in Russia, because I guess there were too many soldiers, you know. They just divided some in Poland and some in Russia, which later on they went to Tashkent, you know, in Russia. And they stayed there forever, you know, until later when they start matching them up with their, you know, uh, with their parents, with, uh, with the kids and all that. It took long, many years, you know, to find your siblings, you know, where they were and all that, through the Red Cross. That's what they did. Well, my mother ended up coming to Poland, and she was kind of happy because she thought she was going to find us. Well, they had a hard time finding us, but they did. They put them in this, uh, like, dormitories, dorm, dorms or something, and they were living all over there in Zgozelec. That was uh, Zgozelec. And uh, they finally put them to work. You know, they're all old, old enough, you know, to work for their food or whatever. And uh, well, that's how my mother got a little job, at least, you know. And she was going to send letters to my father, you know. I don't know how they send them at that time, whatever. But then uh, she could not go back to Greece, that's for sure. She was branded as a communist with a red ink. Mm -hmm. So there are no way my mother could go back. My father could not go, he could not come to Poland. Poland was communist and Greece was the other way. So uh, none of them had a chance to, you know, to get together. And after years and years, finally, she, my father told her that we're going to have to get a divorce and you just take care of yourself, find somebody. And uh, I says, uh, you know, I'll see about myself, but I cannot come. It's a communist country. They won't let anybody, you know, come there. So that was the story. Then... Uh, she met this guy where he was a soldier also, and he was a widower. He had four kids also. So he was a widower, mm -hmm. and everybody's, you know, her, her uncles actually forced her, find yourself a man because you cannot survive by yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? And they were giving her rough time now. The communists were giving her a rough time in Poland because of my mother being on the other side. You know, they said, oh, you, your husband is this and this, you know. So she had her from both sides. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So finally, her uncles, there was a couple of uncles that said, there's no way out for you. You better find somebody because your, your husband already told you, get a divorce. And I think he got the divorce. And so whatever, then she, she was thinking what to do, what not to do. But they gave her the communists now in Poland. They gave her a very rough time because every time she would get a job in a factory or something, there was a lot of factories in Poland in the town that we were. And uh, she would get a job there, you know, to work, but she had to leave, she had to, you know. They would go and tell the top head, whatever, to get rid of her. So she was with no job again. Wow. Oh, yeah. So she would go, you know, in the other shop. There was all kinds of factories. There was a German town before, so there was a lot of factories there. They would do the same thing. They would talk to the main, you know, people, says either you, you know, do or blah, blah, whatever. So she would get, you know, fired again for nothing. She would say, what did I do? Tell me what did I do? And one time she said, she sat in the parking lot there and she says, you're not going to move me out of here. Either you give me my job or I don't have no bread to eat, you know. So finally, Polish people said, those big shots, what kind of people these Greeks are? Mm -hmm. The woman doesn't have food, doesn't have money, you know, and they won't even leave her. I mean, she's working, she's a good worker. And yet, you know, they give her such a hard time because mm -hmm. of my father, well. My father escaped that. He was lucky, he escaped all that, but she had to pay the price. Anyways, after that, she got remarried to a very nice guy, but he was a widower. One of his babies, one of the youngest child was still in Greece. He, that child was only two, I think. 
he, they could not take him with us, you know, like we left, you know, the country. So one of his sisters was left in Saradas, that's another town right on the lake. Mm -hmm. And she had to take care of the boy. And then uh, two of his kids ended up in Hungary. And one ended up in Poland. So it was like scattered all over Europe, you know, the family. So he was a widow and also a widow, widower, mm -hmm. widower. And uh, they decided, or both of them, this would work because she didn't have no money. She had uh, one of her uh, aunts. She brought her necklace, gold necklace, from when she got married. Because in Greece, you know, the wife, the uh, you know, the bride had to have all this. The father-in-law had to give her gold necklace. Mm -hmm. So luckily, that that woman, the, my, we called her Baba. She brought that necklace all the way to Poland, hidden. I don't know how. What, and gave it to her. So then she said, okay, one coin, one gold coin, because she didn't have no coats, nothing. She had a man's coat, you know, mm -hmm. soldier's coat. So she bought herself a coat. And then the other one, she had two left shoes, the Arvila, you know, the big, you know, the soldiers. Mm -hmm. So on, on that, she had shoes now for the snow. There's a lot of, uh, you know, cold weather there. So anyway, she kind of survived a little bit, but she had to go from a place to a place, from a garbage to a garbage to find something to eat. I mean, oh yes, yeah. So she had a very hard time. That's why she decided either I get married to have a the misapokria glata, like mm -hmm. we say, or this is no life. Mm -hmm. And she didn't even know where we were, you know, at that time at the beginning. So she did that. And okay, the long story makes short. You know, after a while, his kids came to Poland, so they joined their father and the other brother. Mm -hmm. So we formed. We formed a nice big family after that. But we were happy that we were together, two different families, you know. Okay. And half of them my, my mothers and half of my stepfathers. But we finally, you know, started, you know, to leave, you know. But all this time we were still in school, you know, in, uh, in under the government, you know. But then after a while they start letting the kids go back to their parents, you know. The parents were all in a different towns and the kids were in different towns. So slowly, slowly, they start kind of mixing. But uh, most of the kids had to go to school, and a lot of them graduated. They, you know, with a, you know, good jobs and all that, and uh, you know, started their families. And a lot of people still left over there if nobody had anybody in Greece, or if Greece did not accept them back, like my mother when she married this guy, and they had nothing against him. But because my mother was again with a red ink mark. She could not go back to Greece. And finally it took my stepfather three years later after he had his passport to finally get a passport. Mm -hmm. Finally, so they ended up all going back to Greece. After all this time, 1950, 52 or something. I've got it in my book there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then uh, that's, uh, they had a hard time going back to Greece because they didn't have no house. The house, the government took the houses. Mm -hmm. So they rented a house, uh, Man was uh, the the owner of the house was in Poland, and uh, he had this house empty. And uh, he told them, "He said, okay, go ahead, go to my house. You can live there. Pay me three hundred drachmi, you know, a month." And uh, so I was the one that was sending all the money for them to, you know, for the list for the house. And then here and there, you know, a little bit, you know, hidden money we had to send them from. America, when I came to America, it was 1958. Mm -hmm. and then, well, I decided, uh, talking about how I got to America. My father, after, after he left Greece, because there was nothing for him there, um, he decided to come to America. He couldn't go to Poland, communist country, so he decided to go to, uh, to America. And uh, they found somebody, how they did it, and a little relative, something, but it was easier for people you know, to go to America. But before Canada, yes, it was easier. But then the, the America let you know people come. So he came here and started from scratch. You know, nothing. He lost the house. He lost everything. We lost everything. I mean, we didn't have nothing left in Greece. Nothing. Yeah. About well, yeah. So uh, just picking up where we left off. So yeah, just tell me a little bit more exactly. You know, how you were able to you know come to America. You kind of set the background. You now, what gave you the opportunity? Where did you go? If you could just start from there. Well, um, after a while. After I was uh, 15 years old, around there, uh, my father, well, my mother was not going to let me go, but my father wanted me to come to go to America because he ended up going to America because there was no other choice for him. Mm -hmm. 
So after a few years there, you know, he decided, you know, to help my mother because, you know, he left her in a situation like that to take me to America. And, uh, well, I had, uh, I didn't say no because, you know, America back then, it was like a oh, like a paradise to people in Poland. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, anyways, uh, he asked my mother if she would let me come. And my mother was thinking and thinking, she do want to send me, but she says, at least one of you go to him and I'll keep the other sister. So mm -hmm. we, like, well, each one has one child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my father started my papers. There was no way that you could get out of from Poland to come to America, but it was no problem to Canada. A lot of people left Poland, they went to Canada. So it took me like three years from the time we started the papers, three years to get finally okay to, you know, to go to America. And I was like 17 years old by then. So that's how I came to Amer but America. But then my father, in the meantime, he decided to get married also mm -hmm. because he needed a wife also. So he went back to Greece and uh, uh, brought this lady. Uh, she was young also, but from a very poor family. And knowing in Greece that the girls got to have a prika, mm -hmm. you know, to get married. Oh, my gosh, some people, you know, gave houses or apartments and all that. Well, they were very poor. They came from Kafkas or from Russia, mm -hmm. these people. And they put them in Lerin in the big town. But they had like four sisters and one brother. And uh, the one, my stepmother, she was like 25 years old, but she didn't have no prika to give a dowry, like they said. Uh, she could not get married. Nobody wanted her without dowry. And, oh, yes. So finally, oh, my father went there to see if he could find a you know, nice lady. And everybody told him, you better take that girl because she's you know, Domakinka, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, she's nice family, but, you know, she can get married without Prika. So my father decided, okay, you know, so he married her 25 years. She was younger than my father, but he says, well, you know, he was in the age that, you know, he was like middle-aged man. And of course, he was on his way, you know, bring, taking me to America. So he was going to have, you know, so she, it was okay with her. Mm -hmm. So he brought her and then uh, uh, they got a little house and, uh, you know, the rest is history. Then, you know, I came. Of course, she was a Greek, okay. uh -huh. a Russian Greek, actually. Oh, yeah. That's a rare combination. Yeah, that was from Kafka, so they came, yeah. Uh, Pondi, they called them Pondi, all those people that came from the Kafka. Okay, yeah. But she was a very here, nice refugee, yeah. Yeah, prosvigir, uh -huh. Uh, but she was very nice. I cannot complain. Mm -hmm. She was very nice to me and, uh, you know, she tried everything. And I kind of learned the Greek from her because, you know, we had to communicate, you know, together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, then, uh, you know, I said to myself, they had one baby, one son, mm -hmm. so my brother. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of not comfortable because she was still young and all that. And I thought, I felt like I was a fifth wheel, you know, and, in the car, whatever they call it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if I find somebody, you know, I'm 17 now, going on 18, I'll just get married and just, uh, you know, try my luck in the mm -hmm. future. So then, you know, people were coming to ask for my hand, but I didn't know anybody. And then Spiro came mm -hmm. with his parents mm -hmm. and they came, you know, to ask for marriage, you know, for me, you know, my father. And he said, well, I can't say nothing. It's up to the girl, you know, mm -hmm. you know. But he says, I didn't even have her for one year. That was seven months later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seven months. And wow. I said, I might as well. I don't know anybody. I don't know my father. I don't know my stepmother. I, I don't know Spiro. Spiro I knew because he was in Poland in the same town. The last year I was in Poland. So I met Spiro actually, but not, we were not going together or anything. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I knew somebody. Finally, somebody from my past. So I decided to get married and just try my luck, just like a lot of women do. Now, when you were in America, though, obviously, I mean, what was life like for the Macedonian immigrant at that time? Was it you know, difficult? Did you guys stick together? What, what was it like? The Macedonians? Yeah. Uh, here in America, yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. Well, Macedonians, uh, the people that came before all this, was before this war, mm -hmm. were still Macedonians, you know? I mean, they spoke their language, they still do now. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody can tell you no in America, no. Yeah. So, 
uh, they form like groups, groups, not uh, parties, but groups, groups. But we didn't have a Macedonian church, that's for sure. But we didn't have a Macedonian church in Greece also. That was like all in, you know, in Greek. So where did so, you go to church? Where? In, uh, in America. In America. Uh, we went to the Greek church because, uh, you know, my father spoke very well Greek mm. because he was working in the bank, you know, he had to. Do. So uh, the, he kind of introduced me to the priest and uh, the priest came over and it was very nice to us, you know, and the priest was used to having Macedonians in his church because there's no other Macedonian church. So they had to go, you know, it's a, a, not a Catholic, it's an Orthodox. There was some like camaraderie between Greeks and Macedonians back then? Not much. No? No. no, no, we were free, you know, there was no, uh, you know. They uh, got along? They got along. Yeah, that's they what I was asking. Along. Okay. Yeah. got along, you know, yeah. I met a lot of Greeks through my stepmother because she mm -hmm. could not speak Macedonian. You know, she could not speak uh, English and she could not speak Macedonian, only Greek. So mm -hmm. we had like, you know, in my family, Macedonian was a Macedonian, Greek was, you know, just like, that's how, of course, I learned the language for myself, but she never did learn Macedonian. So, but there was Macedonian families that were together to the church, you know, and there in the church, there was not any, you know, like, no, like here in Cincinnati, it's more like, you know, Greeks and Macedonians and a lot of Macedonians didn't want to go to Greek, but we were forced because there was no Orthodox. Mm -hmm. But in uh, Clint, Michigan, I lived in Clint, Michigan after I married Spiro. And in uh, Flint, there was a Russian Orthodox Church. So a lot of the Macedonians joined that church instead of Greek because a lot of people didn't like Greek. So yeah. Uh, yeah, we had a very nice church. We had seven different nationalities there. So you had a choice there. I mean, you know, nobody to turn back or to argue with you or nothing. Everybody was like foreigners in, into that church. Sounds like, you know, you kind of, you had to go with what you were given. You didn't have that much choice then, okay. So being in America, obviously, you're liberated from a lot of the problems that you had and a lot of the political oppression that you might have had in Greece and Macedonia. Um, did you have the opportunity to go back to your village in the future? A lot of people tried, but took years and years for some of the Macedonians to go back. A lot of years, and then they start leaving. 1958, 59, I left in 58, but then they slowly they start going back. And the Macedonian suburb of two, but not everybody. Like I said, some were crossed off with a red ink so they could not go. And it took my mother three years later, she got her passport to go to, back to Greece because of, she was, you know, uh, as a communist. Yeah. And there was witnesses also that say that she was a communist, mm -hmm. one of her friends too. Okay. Now, wow. so did you also get a chance to return to your village okay, uh, and eventually? Yeah, from America, no problem. I so, could go anywhere, anytime. Right. So I had no problem. But when we went first time, you know, I saw my house, you know, beautiful home, but it was not ours anymore. Yeah. You see, the government gave all the houses that were our houses to all these newcomers. So Prosvigi, you know, yeah. so that the whole village was like that. Did the village still speak Macedonian when you came back, or was it mostly Greek at that stage? Back, not very many Macedonians were left there. No, you know, most of them were gone. Most of them were gone. And then, there, of course, a lot of them were in different uh, uh, communist countries, too. They were not all in Poland. Mm. So slowly, slowly, the older people still knew Macedonian. But mm. the new people, you know, they're more leaning towards the Greek. So how did this compare to when you were young, when you were um, in the village, uh, you know, seven, eight years old? Were most people speaking Macedonian in the village or were there still Greeks when you were a little kid? Yeah, well, they all spoke only Macedonian, but then they forced us in 19, uh, I have it there in the book, 19, when Metaxat took over, yeah. he abolished Macedonian language. Yeah. And then the people, if they spoke Macedonian, they would be punished. They would go underneath the, uh, underneath the windows of the houses, there were not that tall the houses, mm -hmm. and they would listen if they heard Macedonian, because a lot of the old people, they could not learn language at their age, mm -hmm. but you know, inside in the houses, Skrishnum, like we say, mm -hmm. you know, they wanted to talk Macedonian. And that's how the language survived, because you know, they were stubborn, they didn't want to, you know, lose it. And then once we went to Poland, it was different. You could yeah. speak Macedonian, you know, it was really, Poland was like, not only for Greeks, there was Macedonians too. We had the freedom language. Thank you. So with that, I mean, there's still obviously people in Macedon in Greece that still speak Macedonian. 
what kind of what, what kind of future do you hope they would get living in Greece but being Macedonian? They still had problems all these years, and they had a priest that I heard in all this or whatever, and they gave him a rough time, you know, uh, because he wanted the for the Orthodox churches, mm -hmm. you know, for the Macedonians, whatever. I was not interested in that because I never picked up all this politics. Mm -hmm. But they gave him a rough time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they still, actually now, that you know, of course, the older people died. So the younger people, they went to school, they went to Greek school. A lot of them don't even speak Macedonian anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were born there with all this commerce from uh, Russia, from, uh, you know, Turkish, whatever they were. So it changed on its own, but a lot of people still speak Macedonian. And it's funny that we hear now that uh, they have gatherings around, like picnics and all that now, after all this time. But we lost that time for us. I mean, you know, and we don't have it in our you know, hearts. But now, you know, friends of ours from Canada, they go visiting and they have a good time now. Because there's quite a few that they kept the language, the different villages, we were closer to Yugoslavia, but mm -hmm. those, the northern part, but those further down, they kept their language and it seems like Kostur, Kastoria, wherever, you know, it's called Kastoria. Mm -hmm. A lot of them speak the Macedonian mm -hmm. still, you know, mm -hmm. but then they have that hard time like we did up in northern Macedonia. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Now, being uh, from the family that you came from, when you came to, to AG and Macedonia to Greece, were there any problems for you personally, like knowing who your family was? Did they cause any problems for you? Uh, no, not that, but you know, we went to see our house in the village. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew that uh, it's not our house anymore. They took it away for nothing. And uh, we asked the people that were sitting out in the front of the, uh, you know, there was a chest, but there was a like mm -hmm. well water, whatever you call it. And uh, uh, I said, you know, we're here from America and Canada. But uh, can we go and see my our house? I said because I was born and my daughter and my sister was born there, but uh, she was only four when she left, and I was only seven. But she never saw the house inside. She wants to go and see it. We had to get permission from one, from the other one, you know, through three hands, and they didn't want to. They didn't want us to go in there, you know. But I said, oh, don't you can have the house. We don't care about the house. But let my sister see where she was born. I remember, I've got a little memory, I was seven. I said, my sister was only four. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had to beg to let us in the house just to see. They were afraid that we might come back and get the house back. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Yeah. So you yourself, having lived through this, would you consider what happened to the Macedonians of AG and Macedonia of Northern Greece? Would you consider that to be, you know, ethnic cleansing, where Greece wanted to get rid of? It's what we call it ourselves, yeah. ethnic, you know, cleansing, because they want the Macedonian language out, you know, yeah. and slowly, slowly, the people, the new people, oh, they went to school, Greek school, so they were uh, already prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So the little ones, they didn't know better. They started school already mm -hmm. in Greek. So you know, slowly, slowly, that I mean, they just took over talk over our lives, our houses, our, uh, you know, properties, etc. Yeah. Now, could I, may I ask you something in, in, could you answer in Macedonian? Just one question. Okay. But ako imamme crkva tuka, like sega što imame, you know, mojte deca saka crkva da vode. You know, i ako beše, well, of course, beše po amerikanske pojke to, i vo Flint, što sada be Flint, Michigan, I spend there koliko godine, oh my gosh, most of my life, yeah. Anyways, ja si zevam decata na škola, v crkvata, so English, and English, you know, but Macedonski nema še i tamo, but imamo mnogo Macedonci še odaja v crkva in se zborva še jezik od pojke. Tu, ako dojdeme, no, tu je sad, you know, a lot of these people from the villages, ti je ne znaja troška amerikanski, so it kind of helped, helped to kind of save that language, you know, but they know everything, but Moj stram da zborve, tako se sa broken v Macedonija nekaj. Pa dobro, da je skršeno, kamo li ič ta nema. Da, da. Mijero, ti si Stalinika? 
I'm going to try my best here. Ti thelete na pite stu salinus pu lene oti deni parhun i Makedonas. Τι θα τους πούνε, δεν θα μας ακούσουν anyways, you know. Αυτά τα χρόνια περάσαμε έτσι μόνο με, ε, με φασαρίες, με, ε, you know. But still, ο, ακόμη στην Ελλάδα, α, ακόμη είναι αυτό. Στις, στις άλλες, α, α, στα άλλα τα μέρη, Αυστραλία, α, Καναδά κτλ. Πού και πε, περισσότερο, you know, περισσότερο προσπαθούμε να κάνουμε μια, you know, την, την Μακεδονία μας. Ε, γινόμαστε πιο λίγοι και πιο λίγοι και πιο λίγοι. Οι γέροι πέθαναν όλοι. Mm-hmm. Αυτοί ήταν που θέλανε, που βράζανε, που θέλανε για την Μακεδονία, πέθαναν. Οι καινούριοι τώρα δεν τους νοιάζει καθόλου. Mm-hmm. Είναι, και αυτοί που είναι εδώ παραγενημένοι, forget it, you know. mm-hmm. Δεν τους νοιάζει καθόλου για την Μακεδονία. Και αυτοί που είναι εκεί θέλουν όλοι να έρθουν εδώ. Και έρχονται. Mm-hmm. έρχονται. Και, και βγαίνουν από την Ελλάδα καμπλήθλοι, πηγαίνουν στο Σουίτσερλαν, εδώ, εκεί στην Αγγλία. Δεν θέλει κανένα να ζήσει, γιατί δεν έχουν δουλειές. Τι θα κάνουν. Και δουλειές είχαμε, είχαμε factory σε, σε ένα χωριό ψαράδες, κάμνανε, ε, κάμνανε conserves με ψάρια. Mm-hmm. Ο, είπαμε, α, κάτι άνοιξα εδώ, για να πιάσω δουλειά ο κόσμος. Και αυτό έκλεισε, μετά από δύο-τρία χρόνια έκλεισε. Mm-hmm. Δεν έχουν δουλειά. Αυτό είναι το... Και λιότερο πράγμα που δεν έχουν στο Σκόπιο, τι έγινε, στον Πίδωνα, τι έγινε, είχαν, είχαν, α, τι είχαν για Ζελεζάρα που το λέγανε mm. στο Σκόπιο. Ο κόσμος δούλεψε και you know, ήθελαν για την Μακεδονία, γιατί ήταν όλοι ακόμη με δουλειές. Έκλεισε αυτό, έκλεισε εκείνο και όλοι έμειναν χωρίς δουλειές και όλοι τρέξαν στα άλλα κράτη, φεύγουν. Ευχαριστώ. I'm going to have to translate that one for the uh, subtitles here. <laughs> but um, yeah, Bogo, I want to thank you again for taking some time. Your uh, yeah, stories you. are a treasure. We're interested in you know, my story. Not too many people, no. you know, they, they could care less. No, no, no. Your stories are a treasure in the community here, especially. I wish I was a little bit older. Just a couple of years older, I could have remembered everything. You're, you're fine. And I, I feel very honored that yeah, you took some time to share this in here. So I'll, I promise I'll do you justice on this video. It'll be good. <laughs>